Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the diodes and we're going to look at some waveforms here. And I hope it'll be uh, interesting and you'll learn something, okay? Uh, before we do that, let me just go to the, the board here real quick. Uh, seen this Mac, if you've seen the last couple videos, uh, transform the bridge rectifier and the capacitors. So we're going to talk about the diodes, all right? And there's a couple ratings. You know, here's the specs I kind of wrote down previous video to say things to think about. So one of them is the voltage rating, 600 volts. You want it, this reverse uh, voltage rating. So when the diodes, when you when it's forward bias, you're going to get a voltage drop. Current's going to flow through it, right? So when the waveform up here is positive, it's going to come through here. The current's going to flow, come up here. You're going to get this first bump, and then it's going to return through this diode. So those two diodes are turned on. This diode's off, but he has voltage there, and this guy's tied to here. So he's got the full voltage, the peak of this waveform. When there's a light load, the transformer's not being, you know, loaded down. Uh, it'll the regulation of the transformer will kind of loosen up, and the voltage will peak up. So you want to make sure that even if you think, oh, I got 34 volts out here, but no, this could be higher, maybe 40 volts, maybe higher than that even. In this case, we have 600 volt diodes, way more than what we need. Well, that's great, but the bad thing is, is often the other thing we care about is when this, the one that is conducting, what's the voltage drop across it? We like it to be really small, like a shocky, like 0.4 volts or something. A lot of times we use regular silicon diodes in these bridge rectifiers, and they're, you know, we think 0 0.6, 0 0.7, we put our multimeter across them, right? But these higher voltage ones and these power diodes, these large packages, they can be higher, like 1.5 volts. We're going to look at the data sheet real quick. I'm going to show you where you sit, look for this stuff. The data sheet will actually show over 2 volts because they'll show that based on the rating of the current that it's rated for. Look at this. It's rated for a Ford current of 30 amps. These guys are beefy. Now, 30 amps times, let's say it was 2 volts, that'd be 60 watts. You couldn't do that for very long because it'd get really hot. But you'd have to heat sink it and keep it cool so you could get that 30 amps there. But it can actually do pulsing. Uh, it can re do repetitive forward current pulses at 70 amps. And we are, we're actually going to be doing a kind of a, more of a pulsing current. So it's capable of a lot of current. Now it can do a single pulse of 325 amps. But then it has to cool down again before you can give another 325 amp shot. When you first turn on the power supply, we're going to get this inrush of current, right? We're going to use a thermistor that's going to slow that down. But, you know, you get this inrush of current. So, you know, it's good that it can handle high current. So this is still higher than what we need, but that's always a good thing. And you can get lower voltage diodes that can handle high current. So that might be something we might want to look at. But th these diodes came with this kit. They, I think just in low quantities, they cost over two bucks. So they're pretty good diodes. They're large packages. I think they might be fine, but we probably could find something a little bit better. Now, on the positive side, these diodes are also what they call fast recovery. So when a diode's conducting, and then when it stops conducting, well, as it built, as you know, as you apply voltage to this uh, PN junction, this positive negative junction of the silicon, so you have these carriers that are intermixing, and once they get a certain charge built up, then you get current flow. And you get that voltage drop from that, that charge that's created. When you when the voltage you know here changes and reverse biases that diode, it doesn't instantly change. Kind of like the traffic in an intersection. Light goes red, sometimes there's still cars shooting across it, right? <laughs> so you gotta wait for that stuff to stop. That's called reverse recovery. This one is on the order of I think 40, 50 nanoseconds, pretty darn fast. Another good thing about that is a lot of times like the waveform comes down and then all of a sudden they recover real sharp. And that can anytime you get sharp moving transients, you can get EMI. This is kind of a soft knee on it. So that's a positive. And the fact it's fast, you know, when you have current flow, you have uh, power dissipation, right? Even if it's microamps, you still get some power dissipation because now you have a larger voltage developed across it. So current times voltage is power. Well, 
uh, since these are fast, there's not going to be too much dissipation there. Nothing to worry about. Uh, but yeah, it, it might be interesting to maybe look for something. You still want to be, let's say if we thought we had 40 volts here, um, a 100 volt diode, you still want like a 2x plus. If it's a regulated voltage, it gives you a little bit more comfort. But if it's not, you have to worry about line fluctuations and all that kind of stuff. So you got to think about all that. So those are the ratings. What I am also showing is the the thermal resistance, R theta junction to capacitance. And actually this is a mistake. The thermal resistance inside that package from the semiconductor to the case, you can't do anything about. Once it gets to the case, you can uh, let it just radiate, you know, or you can uh, put it on a heat sink and get it a heat out through conduction or convection airflow. Well, uh, it's, so that that's good to have a real low number these large packages usually have a low number these are less than uh one degree c per watt i think it's 0.7 degrees c per watt we'll look on the data sheet but what i wrote down was the junction to ambient so j a r theta j a and that's 30 i think it's 30 degrees c might have that wrong too <laughs> but so uh so based on that and a 60 watt amplifier I understand it's supposed to, the power supply runs at 150 watts because it's so inefficient. Uh, so each side 75 watts. And so take the wattage divided by voltage to get current. And if we have 34 volts that the board asked for, then we would have 2.2 uh, amps. Now, since each set of the diodes are conducting um, half of that, then we can divide it by half and say, okay, these two diodes get 1.1, these guys get 1.1. Now, it's not, that's not absolutely accurate, but let me explain. Uh, each diode has to supply two amps, then this guy takes over and he supplies the two amps, and they go back and forth. But since they're only on half the time, you can kind of look at it like, well, the average is 1.1, even though they're they're both supplying 2.2 amps when they're on. If they're off half the time, then it's really only 1.1 amp, right? That's another way of kind of looking at that. And then if you say, okay, 1.5 volts when it's conducting, so 1.1 amp times that voltage is 1.65 watts. And if you say you have 1.65 watts, well, times that by this many degrees C per watt, you know, then you get 50 degrees C rise. And that's rise. That's not the temperature that it will be at. That's the rise above whatever the ambient temperature is. So if it's say 20 degrees in here, it'd be 70 degrees, okay? So on the bench, I've seen about 44 degrees. When we look at these waveforms, you'll see that it's not quite 1.5 volts all the time either. So you, the, the average voltage is, is less. So maybe, what if it was half? Then it, it's probably closer to what I see here on the bench, but, and I haven't let it sit on the bench for a long time to run, so kind of hard to tell there too. All right, so I hope this kind of helps you understand uh, the diode a little bit better and, you know, how to select it. A lot of times you'll see those uh, bridge rectifier units. It's basically four, di well it is, four diodes in a package, and they're usually large packages with a hole in the middle. They mount down to the bottom. Those are great too. These are discrete diodes and there's four per side. So you'd, you'd, you could replace these with two bridge rectifiers uh, with four diodes in each package, right? But in, anyway, in this case, I think they use this because they're easier to mount on a board and they're big. Now I mounted mine vertical so I could put heat sinks on them just in case. I'm gonna run them for a while once we get the amplifier and everything going and we'll see how much current, and if it really does rise closer to 50 degrees C, I don't want them to get that hot. So more than likely, I'm gonna be putting heat sinks on them, but for now, I'm leaving them off just so we can see what happens, okay? And the immediate calculations show that it's not, we're not in some immediate danger by doing that. And I already kinda went through that before I powered on and left too long. But often when I'm powering up a new power supply, I power it on, turn it down, touch fill everything once I know the voltages are safe and then I'll do that until I start getting a better confidence level because some things take a while to heat up what if you had a capacitor that 
had too much ripple current in it. it finally heated up and went boom you know you don't want a surprise like that <laughs> and uh yeah sometimes even something installed backwards won't blow up immediately so yeah i i'm kind of slow and and uh getting to the point where i feel safe about just letting it run for a long time and then i use my thermal camera and i look at things because then i can look at everything all at one time and not be surprised by something over here when I was looking at the transistor over here. But, all right, uh, let's come over here. I'm gonna show you the data sheet real quick, just to show you where you find that data, the important data. And then let's look at uh, these waveforms that I've been picking up. Pretty cool stuff. All right, let's do it. Okay guys, this is the data sheet from on semi, as you can see, 30 amp, 600 volt, and they call it the stealth diode. I think that's because it turns off fast and kind of soft. So there's the information there. Two packages. We have the big uh, TO247 package where this is the 220. Some highlights there. Let's just come down to here where you can look at some of these uh, maximum ratings. 600 volts, 30 amps. See here's a repetitive 170 amps. Single time, 325. That's for 60 hertz, you know, because they know that's what you're going to be using it for. 200 watts, if you can keep it cool, right? So let's go down. That's the Ford voltage drop, okay? 30 amps at 25C. So it's going to be in here. If it gets hot, it actually drops a little bit because that's what um, PN junctions do, right? All right, so, you know, you hear about thermal runaway and that kind of thing, right? Diodes don't necessarily do that, but they could if they get real hot. Okay, reverse recovery time, 36 nanoseconds. Okay, the other important thing, which I think is really important besides voltage and current, is this. And this is the 0.75 degrees C per watt. That's theta JC. Theta JA, what I was showing is 30 degrees. And then the theta JA for the 220, the smaller package, look at that twice more than twice as high 62 degrees C per watt okay now let's look at this curve this is an important curve a uh, forward current from forward voltage okay so if we're pulsing currents say in this area this 25 C curve it's probably always gonna be a little bit warmer than that right but anyway yeah uh, worst case scenario even if you kept it really cool when you first turn it on it's gonna be less than 1.5 so yeah, so that should be the worst case for us, the 1.5 uh, for 10 amp pulses. But yeah, you can kind of see, and if it's obviously it's going to be warming up a little bit, it's not. We're we're going to try to keep below the temperature of any of these things, so it's going to be somewhere between this 25 C and this 100 C line. Now this is also the internal temperature, which is going to be, you know, hotter than the case. And just for your interest, this is a forward current, and this is a reverse recovery time. So depending on how much current you have, it takes a little bit more time. See how the curves go up? And something just to be kind of be aware of is diodes do have junction capacitance. So you can see right here, reverse voltage. So when you have reverse voltage on it, you know, say up where it's gonna be turned off, you're gonna be mostly looking in this range. It's gonna be, you know, down here in the, 100 picofarad, 50 picofarad kind of region. But that but that 50 picofarad is just something to be aware of, that there is capacitance in your diodes, okay? And when you really want to delve deep into this, it does take a little bit of time to transfer that heat from the junction to the case or to your you know heat sink. And this is a pulsating current. It shows some time durations based on uh, this rectangle wave shape. So what that tells you is if you have a really fast rising pulse, uh, you may not feel it in the temperature, even though the dye itself is getting very hot. Now I just want to point something out. When you look at this 36, R3060, you'll see it fall under different manufacturers uh, prefix, like the, in this case, ISL uh, 9R. I think the one that came on it's kind of a Chinese company prefix, I believe, but uh, it's, you know, the, several companies make this diode and the specs are all very similar. So I think, yeah, it's, you're gonna get pretty much the same performance regardless of the company. 
especially when we're not pushing it to the limits where you know it has to, we're really relying on a certain spec okay if you are then you might want to buy from a company you know and all that kind of stuff it's always that's always a good idea actually okay pretty cool dial to see from the data sheet right okay let's jump over to the scope and take a look at the waveforms there's some cool stuff that happens and a lot of times when we're drawing things on on boards to try to explain things it's kind of hard to explain all the intricacies all the you know the, all the small things that are happening so a lot of times we're kind of glazing over some of the things just you know saying this is what's happening when there's actually maybe a few little things happening in between so we're going to see that here on the scope come over here and take a look all right in this shot what we're going to see is something pretty cool we're going to look at the dial now i've moved the differential probe channel four the green one here it's 10 volts per division i've moved it to uh to look across the diode so you know typically what you'd see is the you see the waveform say go up when it's reverse bias, sine wave come down as it crosses and can, and turns it on. It would be flat, maybe a volt and a half if you got a volt and a half drop, and then it, as the AC waveform went back up, it turn off the diode and you'd see uh, the sine wave part. Okay, and that's the part where it blocks the waveform. So let's go ahead and just bring up the voltage so you can see. There we go. And you can see where it's turned on, or this is where it's reverse biased, and this is where it's forward biased. Okay, let me bring it up to 120 volts. There we are. Okay, our outputs are all up. Let's see what's going on with this guy. Okay, our out outputs are all up, and it, it's kind of got a little bit of a funky wave shape, you know, this uh, bulge across the diode. Okay, I just froze the waveform so we can just talk about it for a minute. Now, here, let me get a pointer here. Here we go. Uh, okay, the, the green waveform. Uh, the voltage, say it's gonna, it, it should look sinusoidal is what you would imagine. Then it comes down, and then the diode conducts. We see the pulsating current. So uh, the diode gets forward bias to this region. And it's, you know, in this case, let's say it's a volt and a half. It'd be down a volt and a half, and then come back up, and then back down again, right? But it's interesting. Well, first of all, we know the top to sine wave is kind of flat because that's where the pulse of current is causing the voltage drop in the windings itself. So we're getting that kind of waveform. But this is interesting. Like, this over here is kind of, you know, it's not sinusoidal shape. It's it's more almost trapezoidal shape, right? That's because even though the voltage might look sinusoidal coming out of the transformer, the voltage across the diode is the difference between the output voltage and uh, so that's, that accounts for the ripple voltage too, which is this yellow one, and the voltage on the transformer side. So it's really the difference between the two. And since the voltage on the output is a ripple like this triangular thing it changes the the way the voltage actually looks across the diode so i just want to point that out so you can kind of see how this kind of angles down this way and this kind of angles up this way and then when this stops then this kind of proceeds to kind of try to take on that sinusoidal look and then this pulsating current kind of pulls it back down so it kind of messes with the whole waveform so it's not ideal like you'll see people draw on a board like i might draw on a board because to draw something like this it's it's real world it's actually how it works but it's not easy to draw and it's a lot easier to show on a scope i guess okay guys so now what i want to do is turn it back on and I want to show you a little bit more about this waveform. Okay, I turned the scope back on. It's in run mode, so it's not in hold mode anymore. It's just running. You can't see it moving, wiggling around. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the, instead of 10 volts per, we're going to go to, say, a half a volt per. We want to zoom in on this bottom part of the waveform, okay? So let's just go ahead and make it bigger. Now, it's only one amp load right now. Look at that. That's pretty funky looking. 
That's probably not what you expected. Let's just try to look at one of them. Let me get the uh, triggering solid here. Okay, one thing I love about this scope is, is these arrows here, how you can just kind of go through the different sources. So see, I went from the current source, or is purple, to the green arrow. Now it's triggering on the voltage waveform, so I can trigger on this funky looking pulse down here. Now look at that, guys. Notice that when the current pulse happens, you get the voltage drop across the diode. Otherwise, the diode's forward biased right through here, right through this region right here. It's forward biased right there, but there's no current flow, so there's really not much of a voltage drop. See the blue line? That's channel two. That one has no load, so that's why I left it there, so it gives you a nice visual line. So the greens, you know, it's half a volt per division, so it's about a quarter of a volt below. But then when the current actually pulses up, it, it pulses down, and you get that, um, you know, this is half volt per, so it's about one volt, a little bit more than one volt of uh, forward voltage drop. So one amp, so just remember that, one amp load, you get about just over one volt of uh, forward voltage drop. Pretty cool, right? Okay, I'm going to freeze this because I want to talk about this. I want to show you something else that might not be super obvious right now. All right, guys. Now, uh, what I want to show you is we're going to zoom in on just one of these waveforms. Here, let me just zoom in. And I'm going to bring uh, that little, see where the current is right here? Where the current drops right there? I'm going to bring that to the center. Right there, okay? So that's where the current stops. All right, so now, but look what happens here. So this is what I'm, I, I was trying to show you on the last video, is we're charging up the capacitor, and then right up here is where normally you'll see people on a whiteboard or whatever, chalk, you know, on a board, show, okay, cap charges, and then for the peak waveform, this charges this way, but it doesn't really, right? We have this little dimple, this little thing, that happens where there's some sharing going on. And you can actually see that because right here between right that, that peak of that pulse and this line right here in the center of the scope, uh, right there is where the current, this purple pulse actually stops. So that's actually where the current pulses up, stops, and now the capacitor is supplying current through, uh, well actually, from the zero line right here is where the current is actually leaving the capacitor. So that little spot there and this little spot, if I spread that out a little bit more, between the zero line and this, this current is leaving the capacitor. And meanwhile, the green pulse is still there. So that's my point is, well, sorry, the purple pulse. The green is the voltage on the diode. So the, the purple pulse of, of current is, is sharing going to the output plus still charging the capacitor. And at this point, it turns off and then you see this abrupt change. And now the capacitor is just, just charging right through here. So that is, and then you see from this point here to this, it's a straight line. It's very linear through there. And that equation that we calculate how much capacitance we need is based on that. So if we look at that, it's one division, two, three, four, five divisions, say five and a half divisions, one millisecond. So that's 5.5 milliseconds. So in that equation I was showing, one amp, which is what we have right now, and right now we have about half a volt peak to peak, ripple and that all right guys so now if we look up here we see 200 millivolts per division so our ripple voltage is peak to peak is like 200 400 550 like what it shows right here is about 550 so that equation i was showing it was for one amp for one volt peak to peak you would need about you know i was saying about eight millifarads well right now what we have 
is about 16 millifarads, about double that. So it's about half a volt. So that's just about right. Uh, now, if we had half the capacitance, that would double. So it would be right around what I was saying uh, that we need. Now, this is a light load. And the duty cycle, uh, part of what I'm showing you here is the duty cycle, the charge time, is actually changes. Like this discharge time actually changes. It's kind of longer for the light load. Now, watch what happens when we go from one amp to five amps, watch what happens to the diode, and also we can see how the discharge cycle changes too, the pulse width control kind of thing. Okay, let me go ahead and start the scope back up. Okay, we're in run mode. I'll bring the voltage back up. Back up to 120, so we're back to where we started, right? Okay, let me get a couple more pulses in there so you can kind of see everything. Okay, now I'm gonna go from one amp to three, four, five. Okay, let's shrink the current. We're going off the screen. And we got a good voltage ripple and we got that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and freeze that. I think that's a good image. And I'll drop the load back down. Still being extra sensitive or extra cautious. Okay, turn off the power supply. All right, so now we can talk about this. Okay, you can see how much further the pulse goes down because we have a lot more current now, right? We're at five amps. So here, let me spread this out so we can focus on one of these pulses again. Now you can see how much, you know, how much wider this uh, charging current got. So now the diode is supplying current through almost the whole portion of the voltage waveform where it's below this line but not quite. We still have some room here where we could pull more current if we needed to, but it doesn't really need to, right? Okay, now look at this, the discharge time. Look how long this current pulse is supplying current as this voltage waveform drops because we're pulling so much current. And then right here at this corner, you can see that's where everything turns off. Then the capacitor's discharging. So let me just line that up in the center line. Right, right there. Okay, so now we got one, two, three, four, just less than four divisions, where before we had more, right? Now we only have four milliseconds, not even four milliseconds to discharge. But also, look at this, we only have 1.8 volt peak to peak. Even though we have five amps load, we're only getting 1.8. Now, since we have twice the capacitance that I suggest in my formula, it would be 2.5 volts peak to peak. It'd be half of, it'd be, you know, if it's one volt peak to peak for every one amp, at five amps, we would have five volts peak to peak, but we're getting, and then since we doubled the size of capacitance, it'd be 2.5, but it's less because we don't really need that much capacitance. It's probably closer to, you know, if we count this as four milliseconds. So if we use that time to calculate how much capacitance we need, we'd be a little closer. But, you know, I think the six millifarads per every amp load for every one volt peak to peak, that's a good starting point, I think. But, yeah, this is interesting, right? This whole waveform, the way the uh, voltage develops. Now look at this. At five amps... We're at half a volt per division, so we're one, two, uh, three divisions down. So that is, it's almost three divisions. So it's almost a volt and a half of uh, forward voltage drop right through there. So right about that 1.5, and the current is five amps per division. So it's from right here, it's five, it's about eight amps peak and then below the line when the capacitor is supplying the current it's right through here and and we get our ripple voltage our negative ripple voltage dropping down it's right through here and that's five amps that's one division down all right guys uh let me know what you think of this and if you have any questions comments please do that and patrons, thank you for your support and 
Uh, everybody for watching the videos, supporting the channel, that's awesome. Thumbs up if you like the video. That helps the YouTube analytics a lot. It really does. And uh, Oh, and you become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. <laughs> Throw that out there uh, so I can buy more stuff. So, you know, I'm going to put this board together and we're going to made it up to this. We're going to do another test on this, put it together with the amplifier. Got meters crying at me back here. Uh, and then we're going to run this thing and we're going to keep moving on to building this amplifier up. All right. Okay, guys. Hey, thanks for watching. See you next time.